church. The Lord grant us peace in our families and the whole nation in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the leadership development session tonight. Thank you for our brothers and sisters, our workers, our leaders, our pastors. We're asking, Lord, that you open our eyes to behold great, great things in your word tonight in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you stir up your people. Stir up living faith in everyone. Active faith in everyone. We'll move forward and make progress in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. We're coming to James chapter 2. And tonight we're looking at verses 14 through to 26. James chapter 2. I'm reading verse 14. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Can faith save him? We need to understand the way James, the apostle, talked about faith. Many people have thought that James contradicted Paul, the apostle. Or Paul contradicted James. There's nothing like that. No contradiction in the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration. And is profitable for doctrine. And is profitable for instruction. And that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And a passage like this, a passage we need to understand. So we can rightly divide the word. We need to understand what James was talking about. James was talking about works after faith. While Paul the Apostle was talking about works before faith. And he tells it like this. That all the works people do, works of righteousness and works of um, hospitality or whatever, in the sight of God is dead before having faith in the Lord. So we understand works before faith, dead. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, dead works, and of faith toward God. All the works of righteousness that men may do, and any professor that thinking that that will bring salvation to them, all that is dead works. Chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we understand what um, James is talking about and what Paul was also talking about. Works before faith in Christ, before faith for salvation, all those works dead. On the other hand, faith, if it doesn't have work accompanying it, if that faith abides alone, that faith is dead. It's like a tree that has dead roots. There will be no fruit. If there is no fruit, then the foundation is dead faith. Come to James chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Somebody says, I believe, I believe. And there's no accompanying faith. It says that kind of faith is dead. Look at verse 20. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? He repeats that again for us to understand. If that faith stands alone, without any accompanying works, and without anything to show for that faith, 
It says it's dead. Look at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So you understand now, all works before faith, dead. And faith without accompanying works to follow after, that's dead also. And the way the Lord looks at every one of us, he looks at us in the perspective of whether we're only carrying about dead works or we're carrying about dead faith. And he tells us that such people are dead souls. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And you are see quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. We are regarded dead without the life of God in us, without salvation, and without eternal life, we were dead. Look at verse 5. Even so, when we were dead in sins, a quickened us together with Christ by grace, are you saved? It says, all the dead work we had in religion, before we knew Christ by faith, all that was dead and made us look like dead people, separated from the life of God. In First Timothy chapter 5, reading from verse 6, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. He's talking about a person that doesn't know Christ. He doesn't, she doesn't have Christ. She doesn't have life. She doesn't have eternal life. She doesn't have a life. She is not connected with the God that gives us life, spiritual life, supernatural life. She's dead. Dead works, dead faith will make a person dead in the sight of God. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. The same thing with the man. He that liveth in pleasure is dead while he liveth. That's what uh, makes us to understand now. Revelation chapter 3, from verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works. He's examining the works. He's looking at the works. What kind of works are they? I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. You have a name that you live. But looking at your works, they are dead works. Looking at your faith is dead faith. And the summary of that is, although people think you are alive because you are religious, it says you are dead. Uh, look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 59 and verse 60. Luke chapter 9, verses 59 and 60. And he said unto another, follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me, permit me, allow me first to go and bury my father. The father was physically dead. Look at the answer of Jesus. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. You see the use of the word dead there in two places. Let the dead, those who are spiritually dead, those who have dead works, although they are religious, those who have dead faith, those who do not have the life of God in them, let the dead bury their dead. That is, those who have died physically, but you go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 24. For this my son was dead but is alive again. But you remember, the prodigal son, 
did not die physically. If the prodigal son was not dead physically, but spiritually, this my son was dead while he was far away from home, far away from the father, and far away from the life of the family. And he wasted his substance in Rathos living. This my son was dead. But now that he repented, and he returned, and he came back home, and he has life again, and he's going to live like his son in the family is now alive. It says in that verse, he was lost. All those who are lost in sin, all the lost sheep of Israel, they are dead in the sight of God, was lost and is found. Look at verse 32. And it was meet, it was suitable and right, reasonable, that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother, referring to the same prodigal son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. When he was lost in the jungle, in the wilderness of sin, he was spiritually dead. When he is now found and he came back, to the kingdom and he came back to the father's house now is found now he is alive and we need to examine this very well and think about faith because faith is all important as you know as leaders we're saved by faith as you know we're sanctified by faith as you know we receive the holy ghost baptism by faith as you know, we are healed by faith. As you know, deliverance comes by faith. As you know, the fulfillment of the promises of God, they become ours by faith. As you know, he prospers us and he makes us to have progress by relying on the promises of God. Everything is by faith. We came out of the world and were able to stand by faith. And we fight the battle of life because we have the shield of faith. And we'll get to heaven because of this faith, by faith. And so it's very important for us to understand, we're not just talking about saving faith here. There's sanctifying faith. And there's empowering faith. And as a faith that makes us to stand on the promises of God. Faith being so, uh, so simple and so important, essential, we need to understand then what we're reading about today as it relates to faith and works, as it relates to faith and action, as it relates to faith and character, as it relates to faith and the fruit we bear after that faith. Tonight, we're looking at the Word of God concerning the inseparable connection between active faith and accompanying works. Two things, active faith and then accompanying works. The inseparable connection between them. The inseparable connection between active faith and accompanying works. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the destitution of dead faith without appropriate works. The destitution of dead faith without appropriate works. Number two, the demonstration of decisive faith with approved works. Not just any works, approved works works approved by god the kind of righteousness approved by god and the kind of action approved by god the demonstration of decisive faith with approved works point number three the distinction of dynamic faith the distinction of dynamic faith through applicable works, reliable works, right works, and the works that go along with such faith. Number one, the destitution of dead faith without appropriate works. We're coming to James chapter 2. 
James chapter 2, reading from verse 14. James chapter 2, reading from verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith? Understand? Not that he has faith, but that's what he says. He says he has faith, but he cannot prove it. He says he has faith, he cannot demonstrate it. He says he has faith, he cannot convince anyone, and has not works, can faith, that kind of faith, save him. If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. The, what does each profit? That kind of faith, I'm praying for you. That kind of fear, I'm by your side. That kind of faith, I believe the Lord will take care of you. That kind of faith, I go ahead and be filled and be satisfied and be happy. Although I'm not demonstrating any good works to go along with that hope and without faith and without encouragement or confidence, it says even faith, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Dead being alone. There is no association with any other thing. The faith is standing in isolation. There's no repentance, and there's no good works, and there's no behavior. There's no thirst after God. There's no passion after God. And there's no thirst for the things of God. But I have faith. I believe God. I believe God. It says that faith that is standing alone is dead. Look at John chapter 22. Those who said they believed, but then there was no evidence of that faith. John chapter 2, reading from verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. They said they had faith. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Look at this, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man inside their heart there was nothing to show that they really believed it was faith in isolation they saw the miracles and without any internal commitment and without any internal determination, they were going to follow through and follow God and they were going to make him the Lord of their lives and he will be the ruler of all their actions once they become his followers. All that was not there and Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men their faith was not grounded and their faith did not have appropriate action appropriate behavior appropriate discipleship mindedness appropriate works and because of that he wouldn't commit himself unto them dead faith without appropriate works titus chapter 1 verse 16 titus chapter 1 verse 16 they profess that they know God. That's their profession. That's their declaration. That's their testimony. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. That He is in their action. They, they don't show that they have any relationship with Christ. They do not show that the blood of Jesus falling from Calvary, coming to them from Calvary, has done any transformational work at all. The same old creature they were, they still remain. And because there was no evidence of that faith, it says, they, even though they profess they know God, they are still abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work, reprobate. Unto every good work, reprobate. Because of that, the profession of faith meant nothing. Because they didn't have accompanying works. 
and the result of really believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1. What the Lord is looking for is fruit. After we say we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it says show the fruit, show the evidence that faith has surely done a transforming work in our lives. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, do I speak of the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity as love? I am become a sounding brass or is tinkly symbol it says uh, although people will say i have such great faith you know i can speak in tongues let me demonstrate it to you and let me speak uh, what language do you want me to speak language of men or language of angels and then they rattle on it says uh, look away from that now how about the fruit of love the fruit of the spirit is love and peace and joy and long suffering and patience and temperance and meekness and fidelity against such there is no law that is if that evidence of the indwelling spirit which brings us the fruit of the spirit if it's not there all the faith about you know our faith i speak in tongues our faith i move mountains our faith i do this it says it's dead in the sight of god look at verse 2 and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, great faith, mountain moving faith, and um, you know, prophet, prophetic faith, whatever kind of faith, so though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. It's empty in the sight of God. If the face does not change our behavior, if that face does not change our character, if that face does not make us new creatures in Christ, it says, it's nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. In the sight of God, zero is zero. Nothing is nothing. And all those things that come before lively faith and before active faith, before life-transforming faith, is nothing in, a, in the sight of God. Look at verse 4. Charity suffers long. When faith comes, it will bring the love of God and charity. And that will now show patience as we deal with each other and is kind that his kindness will come. This is the work we are talking about. This is the work the scripture is talking about. That when we have faith in God, saving faith, transformation, uh, transforming faith, that we're going to suffer long, be patient. We're going to be kind. Charity envies not. If uh, we're still envying like we envied before we said we came to Christ, it's saying that that faith is dead. And that faith does not do any work. And that faith does not amount to anything in the sight of God. Charity envieth not, and charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. If the same arrogance is still there, after we say we have faith in Christ, if the same pride is still there, after we say we believe in Christ, it said that faith is dead because pride is still there and the work that is the result and the fruit of humility is not in our lives. It said that faith is dead. Verse 5, it does not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own if somebody is still self-centered and is seeking his own advantage every time and anything he wants to do even though he says uh, you know i'm a believer and this is my work and this is the evidence i do this i do this i do this but at the back of his mind everything he does has a question what will i get out of this 
what's my benefit out of this yes i'm going to serve god what will i get i'm going to help my neighbor what will i get i'm going to do this what will i get what will they give me for what i do it says if he's seeking his own his faith is not genuine his faith is not a lively his faith or his dead faith and it's not easily provoked thinkers no evil the faith that we have that shows that we are really connected with the Lord as God is good, he passes the goodness unto us. As God is gracious, he passes the graciousness unto us. And as God is helpful, he passes that helpfulness unto us. But if we think evil of other people, and if we're easily provoked, uh, we get angry when something happens, or begin to curse, or begin to abuse or insult uh, people because we're angry. And then after that, we're saying, in any case, I thank God I believe in Christ, and it's my faith that will take me to heaven. That's dead faith. Because that faith does not have appropriate works, appropriate behavior. It says it rejoices not in iniquity. If he finds, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, killing each other and they are fighting uh, and he's there cheering them up on the side of the road and he said, yes, give it to him. It's good for him. He merits that. Serve him well. He deserves that. Or if he sees the people that say they are, you know, supporting uh, this personality or supporting that other personality, if he sees them clashing, you know, and he sees them breaking bottles and knocking their heads, if he takes joy in that he doesn't have faith the real faith he might go to church on sunday he might even say i raised up my hand at your crusade that's dead faith because he rejoices in iniquity if uh, something happens uh, that woman lost uh, the pregnancy and then this fellow says i'm a believer he rejoices in that that person has uh, maybe a downfall or setback and he says that's good for him that's good for him he offended me and i know anyone that offends me they must suffer for it he says if he's rejoicing in iniquity if he rejoices not in the truth he's not a real believer the faith he claims is dead faith it says, uh, charity, believe, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. You can live with such a man, you can abide with such a person because they have real faith. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, and I'm reading from verse 31. Ezekiel chapter 33, reading from verse 31. Here we're told about a people who claim to be worshipping God. In verse 31, Ezekiel 33, And they come unto thee as the people cometh. So you'll think these are religious people, these are sincere worshippers, they sit before thee, as my people they hear thy words but they will not do them for with their mouth they show much love but their heart goes after their covetousness that's what he's talking about the people that say they believe in christ they believe in god they believe the scriptures they believe that, that god is almighty and they believe that jesus will can do all things and they believe that they have given their lives to jesus they have faith in jesus but they will not obey the word of god the grace to obey and the grace to live and the grace to stand on the word of god they do not have it says they have dead faith we come to matthew chapter 23 matthew chapter 23 we're reading from verse 23 want to use scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye pay tithes of meat and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment mercy faith these ought ye to have done 
and not to leave the other undone. The works that come before lively faith, the works like paying tithes, like dressing as a Christian not to dress, like saying some things that, you know, church people say, God bless you. That is great. The Lord be with you. And the language looks like they have copied everything from the believers, but their faith is not real. Real behavior, real character is superficial. Look at verse 27. Want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, appear righteous unto men. But within, where God is looking at, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. As we uh, come back to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. I read from verses 19 and 20. It's talking about these people that are destitute because the faith they proclaim is dead faith without appropriate works. In James chapter 2 verse 19, thou believest there is one God, that's not enough, that works well though. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe and tremble. It's uh, talking to people that uh, they say, I believe God, I believe God, I believe in God. And yet, the word of God does not make them tremble. They hear about heaven. They hear about hell. It doesn't make them tremble. They hear about judgment to come. It doesn't make them tremble. It says, but you don't even have the face of the devil. Because the devils believe that God is going to judge them on the final day. And they tremble, they shudder because of that coming judgment. Look at an example. There are many examples in the New Testament, but look at one. Matthew chapter 8, reading from verse 28. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gagasins, there met him two possessed of devils coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? You see what the devil says, say what the demon says, saying, uh, number one, they called him Jesus. And so it's not enough. You call him Jesus, that's not enough. Show that you know in Jesus, your connection to Jesus, your conversion by Jesus is producing. Uh, good fruit in your life. They called him Jesus. They said, Thou Son of God. These are devils. These are demons. And he called him Son of God. It's not enough. I called him Son of God. What has that Son of God who died on Calvary, what has he done in your life? You believe there's one God, that's great. You believe there's Jesus, that's great. You believe Jesus is a Son of God, that's great. Where is the fruit of that faith? And where is the fruit of that calling him? And then says, Had thou come hither to torment us before the time? They were afraid. Are you going to cast us into the uh, lake of fire? At this time, they believed and they trembled. They trembled. You see the people that can hear the word of God and they will not tremble if they're doing something wrong. They will not tremble if they're going astray and there's no guilt in their conscience and they just go ahead and they commit sin with impunity. They do not have even the faith of devils. Look at Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 24. 
Acts 24 verse 24 and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla which was a Jewess he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith concerning the faith in Christ and as a reason of righteousness temperance and judgment to come Felix trembled as Paul the Apostle spoke about the judgment to come and the need to have self-denial and the need to have righteousness that goes beyond the surface it says this Felix a governor he trembled and there are people that will say they have faith in Christ and they don't tremble at the watch of God it says that faith is had not having any root that faith does not have any basis even the devils and even people who are not saved they hear the word and they tremble but you know Felix was not uh, saved by that trembling look at that verse 25 and answered go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season I will call for thee he wasn't ready to repent and he wasn't saved so just to say that I believe he believed that there is a final judgment he believed there's eternal judgment and it is because of that faith in the judgment to come that's what made him tremble but he loved money more than his soul look at verse 26 he hoped also that money should have been given him or Paul, that he might lose him, that he might, uh, you know, remove the yoke and remove the chains of imprisonment. Wherefore, he sent for him the offering and communed with him. He wanted money. The people that say that, you know, they believe in Christ, they believe in Christ, they give bribes, they receive bribes. They have the love of money and everything they do they are asking for money if they're going to check your file in the office if you make application there they're going they're expecting you give them some money if they're going to do the right thing what they should do for you officially they expect that you'll give money but they go to church and they're religious and they say they go to even a gospel church an evangelical church a Pentecostal church but money is their Lord and because of that money they will not do the right thing the Lord is saying it's not enough to say I believe I believe there must be fruit to show that that faith is real we're coming to point number two the demonstration of decisive faith with approved works the demonstration of a decisive faith with approved works we're looking at james chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 18. yea a man may say thou hast faith and i have works that he is one of these people that they do not want to face reality they say okay there are two things number one faith number two works you keep works and do works and i will have faith that's exactly what the apostle is saying that works standing alone by itself is not enough it will be dead if works stand alone by themselves if good behavior morality stands alone by itself if good behavior and self-righteousness stands alone by itself without faith connection with the Lord and with Calvary and with the atonement of Jesus Christ that is not enough on the other hand whether faith or works standing alone each of them will be dead so he says ye a man may say thou hast faith and I have works show me thy faith without works and I will show thee my face by my works. Look at that. Show me thy face without works. You cannot do that. Faith is invisible. Trust is invisible. And confidence internally is invisible. And so that faith must have something. 
that we can see that we can touch something tangible before we can say that is faith if there is faith without any attachment faith without any accompaniment faith without any works associated with it we cannot see the faith because it's like wind it's invisible it is what it does how it moves the trees or blows something it was okay that is the wind it the breeze blows on you you feel it when there's something to feel something to see something tangible something to identify that's what makes you to understand there's faith there that's why you cannot say show me thy faith without thy works you cannot do that and it says now this is what is possible show me i will show thee my faith how by my works i have faith in christ I'm connected to Christ. His grace has passed into my life. And because of that faith connection with Christ, I'm producing good fruit. I'm producing the works. And the works will show what kind of faith I have. The demonstration of decisive faith with approved works. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 2. Reading from verse 8. Ephesians Chapter 2, we're reading from verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It says salvation is not earned. Salvation is not purchased by you. Salvation is purchased by another person, the Savior, the Redeemer. And the one who died for us on the cross of Calvary, he paid the price. And he made that salvation available. It is not, look at verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. What does that mean? It means all the works we did before we met Christ, they were dead works. And so those works could not save us. But now we repented. We even have to repent of the dead works because all the good things apparently that we thought we did were proud of them. I'm the one that did that. Look at that man uh, wearing that shirt there. I'm the one that gave him that shirt. Look at that a person there wearing the shoes. Uh, would, can you tell? Can you imagine who gave her those shoes? I'm the one that gave the shoes. Look at that man going there. I'm the one that paid the house rent. Look at that other one. I'm the one educating uh, his children. Pride comes to all the works we do before a uh, salvation before faith in christ if uh, people do not recognize it we well, want you know we will talk and talk and meander until we get to the point that people will know i was the one that did that all that kind of work before salvation did because it's changed by pride but after that salvation after we are born again there is good works coming after that salvation look at verse 10 for we are his workmanship you see that after we are saved where is workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works unto good works now that we are saved by faith not what was saved by the sacrifice of jesus christ on the cross of calvary good works will follow because it says was workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works which god has before ordained that we shall walk in them that's what the lord has ordained that after we are saved we must walk in that path of goodness let's come to uh, chapter 16 of acts acts chapter 16 we're reading here from verse 30 acts chapter 16 reading from verse 30 and he brought them out and said sirs what must i do to be saved what must i do to be saved any works that i will do any activities that I will carry out, 
any ocean I will wash in, any money I will give to the beggars, anything I will do to purchase my salvation, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just the way you are now. Without going out to do any work and without going to increase the dead works of a dead soul, it said, Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. But start to cheer and they speak unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Now he believed. What's he going to do? Look at verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Gentleness, kindness, compassion, mercy followed after that faith. After we are saved, the accompanied work, the approved works will be that now we are kind, we are gentle. We're compassionate and we alleviate the suffering of those who are suffering. It says it took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and, but, and he was baptized and all his straightway. Look at verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house. Remember Paul and Silas were prisoners. And remember, this man was a Philippian jailer, but now he was hospitable unto them. He knew that the food they were giving them in the prison was not good enough. Now he is saved. Now he has saving faith, and because of that faith, here is the fruit that followed. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoicing, and rejoice, believing in God with all his house. If you are truly saved by faith, you will demonstrate that because good works will follow that salvation. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. As Paul the Apostle, you cannot set Paul the Apostle against James. Because uh, if you read, uh, you know, Paul the Apostle, that was saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. He's talking about works before salvation. And all those works before salvation, they are dead. But now, after salvation, which is what James is talking about, that after you say you have faith in Christ, then good works will follow. If good works uh, do not follow, then you are not saved. That's just dead faith. And Paul the Apostle is saying, uh, you Thessalonians, I remember your work of faith. After you believed and faith was a foundation, the works came. And your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And then he goes on to say, for our gospel in verse 5 came not unto you in what only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became out of faith, and ye became after being born again, and ye became, after manifesting faith, lively faith, active faith in Christ, ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Living faith, lively faith, active faith, transforming faith, does not leave a man where he met, where that faith met the man. The faith will move him forward. There will be actions of faith. You became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that 
ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your face to God word is spread abroad. Remember, faith is invisible. And it is the action of faith that people knew about that they said these people have believed those people have believed and it says so that we do not need to speak anything verse 9 for they themselves show of us what manner of entraining we urge unto you how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. If they said they believed in God, they believed in Christ, their faith in Christ, and they were still worshipping idols, the word of God says that's dead faith. You're still your old self. You're still the old man living like that. But these people having lively faith, active faith, it said they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. The uppermost thing in their heart now is that they knew that Christ is coming. And because Christ is coming, we must remain as the spotless, righteous uh, wife or bride of the Lamb, so that we'll make it on that day, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's telling us that faith eventually leads to a life of righteousness. It leads to obedience of the word. Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, reading from verse 26. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations, look at this, for the obedience of faith, for the obedience of faith. Faith, lively faith, produces obedience. But if the same old nature, the same carnal nature, and the same disobedience against every word of God, every precept of God, if disobedience is still there, it says that's dead faith, but lively faith, living faith, active faith, will move us and lead us to uh, the kind of uh, life we ought to live in obedience to his word. In James chapter 2, James chapter 2, Reading from verse uh, 20, uh, reading from verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Many people, as they read this, they say, you know, James is talking about justification by works. Whereas Paul the Apostle tells us about that same justification, and Paul the Apostle said it's by faith. Paul and James are talking about two different things. Number one, Paul the Apostle spoke about justification before Isaac was born. Before Isaac was born. And if you look at Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter 4, the justification Paul the Apostle spoke about was before Isaac was born. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 1. What shall we say then, that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, remember now, works before salvation works before faith in God. He has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what says the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him for righteousness. We did he believe God that it was counted to him for righteousness? Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We're looking at verse 6. Genesis 16, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And you know at this time, Isaac wasn't born yet. And so Paul is referring to the time when without any self-righteousness, without any personal works, the Lord gave Abraham the promise and he believed that and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, after that, the word of God came on and it says in chapter 17, when Abraham was 90 years and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the Lord, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. He was already a friend of God. He was already in the kingdom of God. He already had the faith that brings us in. And it's not, it's only after this now. We come to chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did test, term, tried Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take thy, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. This after he had believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. This is after already he was living, he was walking before the Lord. And the Lord now said, Offer him there for a bunch offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And he did that in obedience to God. And that obedience or the obedience of faith is not something before uh, the faith. Let's come back to James chapter, uh, James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham a father justified by works? What kind of works? When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. That he is the Lord now justified or established him and because of this all the promises that god gave before he said because you have obeyed my voice and you have not kept your son from me that in blessing i will bless you and the promises god had given him before they were now justified and maintained and also if you look at verse 25 james chapter 2 verse 25 likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Rahab received the spies and then they gave her a sign, a token. They said, You must hang this scarlet thread on the window so that when we come, will see that and we will know that you have kept to this instruction and covenant and then all the people of your father's house you will bring them in and when you bring them in nobody will touch them but one condition you must not tell you must not reveal our errand and that is what we have come for you must not reveal to anybody here until we come and after she believed that, she had the joy of salvation. And now after, it took some time before they came eventually. And now she was eventually uh, delivered from the destruction over there. We're coming to point number three now. The distinction of dynamic faith through applicable works. Applicable works, reliable works. The works were due that this is applicable. We know that we are saved. We know we're children of God. And uh, because of that, here is the life we live. We're coming to James 
chapter 2 again I will read him from verse 22 from verse 23 James chapter 2 verse 23 and the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and unto, uh, unto him for righteousness and was called the French of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Not by faith in isolation. Not by faith that is standing alone. What St. James referring to here? We'll come to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. It says in verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was told, when he was called to go out, underline those words, go out, when he was called to go out, into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, underline that word obeyed, and he went out, underline those words, went out, not knowing whither he went. The face of Abraham, as the Lord spoke to Abraham and called him, the faith is described in this way, go out, Yes, Lord, I will obey. He went out. Go out, went out. Go out, went out. And as we look at the demonstration of faith that makes a person distinguished, that makes a person stand tall, taller, and higher than every other person, they are described in those words, go out, went out. Come to Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 4, I read from verse 12. Exodus chapter 12, Abraham was not the only person that God will tell, go. And their response, if they really believe the Lord, will be the wait. In um, Exodus chapter 4, verse 12, now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Verse 18, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Go, and he went. Verse 27, in verse 27, And the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. There's no argument here. There was no carnal reasoning here. It's been away for 40 years. And I don't know what direction I will go. I don't even know whether I'm still alive. The Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went. And he went and met him in the mouth of God and kissed him. And then they came together and approached Pharaoh together. Go. And he went. That's what the Lord is expecting. That if we are actually believing him, the word go will have a practical, applicable response. I'm looking at Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1. Joshua chapter 2. We're reading from verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, even Jericho. It was a place they had never gone before. 
and their going will determine whether the children of Israel will enter at this time. And these two, they must have known what danger was ahead of them. They must have known what difficulties will ensue as they went to the land. If those people in Canaan, if they discovered them, but to see faith will respond to the word go. And it says, and they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Go and they went. That's the face of Abraham. And all the sons of Abraham by faith that came after is a description of the face that we possess. Go and then we go. Look at verse 9. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that your terror is falling upon us and that and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. But we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you. When he came, when ye came out of Egypt, what ye did unto the two kings of the Ammonites, the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan and Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed, and as soon as we heard, and we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither was there, did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath as they got there they saw that the lord had prepared the ground remember go they went in second kings the description of faith that shows after we have come to know the lord after we have put our faith in christ he gives us he tells us what to do and we respond immediately second kings Chapter 1, we're reading from verse 15. Second Kings chapter 1, we read from verse 15. In verse 15, and the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. Fear will cancel faith. As fear grows up, faith goes down. And as faith grows up, fear will go down. And as the fear comes to the maximum level, faith will come to the minimum level. They walk in opposite directions. Go, go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. Go, and he arose and went. And he arose and went, and then he delivered the message the Lord had given him. Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, we're reading from verse 10 and verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 3 and 11, verses 10 and 11, pardon me. Ezekiel 3 verse 10. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears and go. That's the word, and go. If we are walking in the footsteps of Abraham, when we hear that word, that word will not stand in isolation. There must be a response to that word, go, get thee to them of the captivity, unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. Verse 14, so the Spirit lifted me up, and took me away, and I went. And I went in the heat, 
in the passion, that's what that word there means, in the bitterness, in a bitterness, in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Go, and he went. We're looking at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. We're reading from verse 11. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Luke 17, 11. And it came to pass, as he went to, Jer to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They wanted healing. They wanted cleansing from their leprosy. And he saw, and when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. He had not even prayed for them, but he knew he was master, master of all circumstances. They wanted cleansing from their leprosy. And he told them, go, show yourselves unto the priest. Well, are we going to go and show ourselves to the priest? We're not cleansed yet. We're not healed yet. We have not seen any change yet. He didn't say that. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. They went, go. And without seeing any physical sign of what might have happened, they went. And when they went, the answer came. As we obey the Lord, your answer will come in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. The same go, go to the sick and go to the sinners and go and preach. And he said unto them, take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have to coats a piece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence, def and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when ye go out of that city, shake off the uh, very dust of your feet for a testimony against them, and they departed and went. They departed and went. That's faith. That's faith. There's no money. There's no script. There's nothing else we're carrying. We don't know we're going to be sustained. We're going to an uncharted area. And we're going to a place we have not been before. And you're not giving us something like security that will depend upon there. He said, go. And they went through the towns and, the, and preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. He has called us to go. We're going to go. We faith, we're going to go. It's the demonstration of our faith. When he says go, and then we respond to that, and we go. We're coming to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, I read from verse 11. Acts chapter 9, we're reading from verse 11. In Acts chapter 9, verse 11, here the Lord was talking to Ananias, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called straight. Arise and go. Arise and go. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. You're sending me to a dangerous man. And you're sending me to a bloodthirsty man. You're sending me to the greatest persecutor the Christian church ever knew of. But God said, Go. 
and go into that street and go to that place look at verse 15 the lord said unto him go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the gentiles and before kings and the children of israel did he go verse 17 and Ananas went his way. Go, and he went. To Abraham, go out of the place where you are. And then he obeyed, and he went out. And that is the demonstration of faith today. Whatever God is telling us, he's telling us to go and preach the gospel. He's telling us to go and knock on doors. He's telling us to go to individuals. And he says, and as went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. I pray that this kind of dynamic faith that obeys, that does what the Lord has called us to do, will have, will manifest in Jesus' name. We'll not be carrying about dead faith that has no action. Dead faith that doesn't have any response. Dead faith that doesn't have any obedient activity at all. In Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 15. Mark chapter 16 verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go preach the gospel to every creature verse 20 and they went forth go and they went forth go and they responded that's faith that's faith the faith uh, the faith that makes us stagnant that makes us do nothing that one is dead faith that one doesn't have any fruit that one doesn't have any commendation from the lord go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature verse 20 and they went forth and preached everywhere the lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following and the whole church said and I pray that the angels will say amen concerning your obedience in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has taught us today about active faith and accompanying works. Not dead works, not dead faith, and not dead souls, but the kind of faith that actually works and does what he taught you to do and we're not going to be in destitution because of dead faith there's going to be the demonstration demonstration of decisive faith with abroad works and the distinction of dynamic faith through applicable works let the record be clear concerning you that you are the one that obeys god because you believe on the lord jesus christ go and they went